On Thursday, the 23rd of April, there was a video conference meeting of the EU leaders to discuss once again what to do about the coronavirus pandemic and the ensuing lockdown of production across the area. In particular, there is the vexed question of how to help out those EU member states like Italy and Spain that have been hit hardest by the pandemic. Over three days and two nights of teleconference, the finance ministers of the Eurozone fumbled their way towards an emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The pigs Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain aimed high with a demand that the Eurozone states share the burden of the crisis with a jointly issued debt instrument known as a coronabond. The Fangs Finland, Austria, Netherlands, Germany or Frugal Four beat them back down, proposing that each member of the currency union bear its debts alone. The Dutch finance minister Wapka Hoekstra played bad cop. He rejected a mutual bond guaranteed by all states, arguing that it was Italy's fault that it had such high public debt that it could not afford to pay for the pandemic itself. He did not trust the profligate spending ways of the likes of Italy. This echoed the Eurogroup's callous stance against Greece during the so-called Euro debt crisis of 2012-15. The southern states, backed by France, protested that the Dutch minister's position stood against the whole idea of the European project, supposedly designed to bring warring European nations into one integrated and harmonious whole. We leave nobody behind, the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, proclaimed in her opening speech to the EU Parliament at the beginning of 2020. We need to rediscover the power of cooperation, she told the World Economic Forum in Davos three months ago, based on fairness and mutual respect. This is what I call geopolitics of mutual interests. This is what Europe stands for. These fine words turned to dust at the finance minister's meeting. In the end, the weak southern states capitulated to the frugal four, as they had no alternative. Mario Centeno, the Portuguese finance minister and current Mr. Euro, brokered a late-night compromise. At the end of the day, or should I say, at the end of the third day, he announced, what matters the most is that we rose to the challenge. But the compromise falls way short of helping Italian capitalism out of its mess. The finance ministers agreed on a package of 500 billion euros to alleviate the crisis. An ESM credit line will be established, up to 240 billion euros, which, although only subject to minor conditionality, will be limited to covering direct and indirect health costs. But this credit line will probably not be used by Italy, already burdened by sky-high public sector debt only surpassed by Greece. There will be a EU program to grant member states cheap loans without conditions to support short-time work, which is called short support to mitigate unemployment risks in an emergency. This will enable the EU to borrow on the markets and to pass on the funds to the member states. But this is just a short-term measure. Furthermore, there will be loan guarantees from the European Investment Bank for companies. And the ECB is now buying up government bonds on a large scale under the PEP Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program. The PEP program is thus currently ensuring that the Italian government can continue to refinance itself at very low cost during the corona crisis. But all these are short-term measures or leave Italy burdened with yet more debt. Greece got the same treatment in the euro crisis and now has so much debt that it will never be able to pay it off this century, while the interest on that debt eats into the available tax revenues needed to provide public services and investment. French President Macron has wailed at the euro finance minister's decision. He warned that the EU was in danger of unraveling unless it embraces financial solidarity. His solution was a joint virus recovery fund that could issue common debt with a common guarantee to finance member states according to their needs rather than the size of their economies. You cannot have a single market where some are sacrificed, he added. It is no longer possible. To have financing that is not mutualized for the spending we are undertaking in the battle against COVID-19 and that we will have for the economic recovery. Yes, he knows that this was against all the dogmas, but that's the way it is. He meant mainstream neoclassical austerity measures. Macron recalled France's colossal fatal error in demanding reparations from Germany after the First World War, which triggered a populist German reaction and the disaster that followed. It's the mistake that we didn't make at the end of the Second World War, he said. The Marshall Plan, people still talk about it today. We call it helicopter money and we say, we must forget the past, make a new start and look to the future. Here Macron echoed the criticism of John Maynard Keynes in his famous critique of the imposition of reparations imposed by France, Britain and the US on Germany after WW1. 
Keynes called for a scheme for the rehabilitation of European credit where Germany would issue bonds and the former enemy nations would guarantee the German bonds severally and jointly, in certain specified proportions. This Keynesian solution is in essence what is being proposed now with EU Corona bonds, to be financed and guaranteed by all member states. But even if Corona bonds were introduced would that be enough or even the right solution to the massive slump that is now hitting Italy and all the weaker states of the EU? As right-wing Italian populist Matteo Salvini commented, I don't trust loans coming from the EU. I don't want to ask for money from loan sharks in Berlin or Brussels. Italy has given and continues to give billions of euros each year to the EU and it deserves all the necessary support, but not through perverse mechanisms that would mortgage the country's future. Italy has a huge public sector debt burden, not because the government has engaged in profligate spending. On the contrary, the government has adopted permanent austerity, running annual surpluses of tax revenues over spending excluding debt interest for 24 out of the last 25 years. This austerity has meant the running down of public services, the degradation of the health system so it could not cope with pandemic and has added to the terribly poor growth in productivity and investment for over two decades. As a result, Italian government support in the pandemic will be minimal. The immediate fiscal impulse for Germany, in the form of additional government spending on medical equipment, short-time work, subsidies for small and medium-sized enterprises, etc., amounts to around 7% of economic output in 2020, compared with only 0.9% for Italy. The Italian economy has been in permanent crisis, but the negative economic effects of the corona shock have worsened it. On its own, Italy will not be able to get the economy back on track after the corona lockdown. According to the latest estimates by the IMF, nobody in Europe will have higher gross financing needs maturing debt and budget deficit than Italy. All a corona bond would do is tide Italy's finances over for the period of the slump, but offer no way to restore the economy, employment and investment. After the slump, Italy's public debt would be even higher than the 130% of GDP it is now. The IMF expects the annual primary surplus on government finances to turn into a 5% of GDP deficit, while debt to GDP rises to 155%. That is why the interest being demanded by those prepared to buy Italian government bonds has been rising, especially relative to Germany, where the interest is actually negative. The reality is that Italian capitalism, like that of Greece, is just too weak to turn things around. I shall return to the unending tragedy of Greece and its prospects in the Covid crisis in a future post. But why is Italian capitalism so weak? And more to the point, why has Italy's membership of the Eurozone not produced a stronger Italian economy? The answer lies with the nature of capitalist accumulation. Unifying various nation-states into one fiscal and monetary unit poses huge problems for capitalism. Historically, it has only been achieved through military conquest or civil war, the Federal Union of the U.S. was achieved that way by the military defeat of the southern states. Capitalism is an economic system that combines labor and capital, but unevenly. The centripetal forces of combined accumulation and trade are often more than countered by the centrifugal forces of development and unequal flows of value. There is no tendency to equilibrium in trade and production cycles under capitalism. So fiscal, wage or price adjustments will not restore equilibrium and anyway may have to be so huge as to be socially impossible without breaking up the currency union. When the euro was devised, the aim was to bring about closer convergence and integration of EU states by monetary union. But the EU leaders set convergence criteria for joining the euro that were only monetary interest rates and inflation and fiscal budget deficits and debt. There were no convergence criteria for productivity levels, GDP growth, investment or employment. Why? Because those were areas for the free movement of capital and labor and where capitalist production must be kept free of interference or direction by the state. After all, the EU project is a capitalist one. 